Okay, start. Let's start. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, let's begin. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming today for this um, workshop. So today we'll be introducing some um, augmented and re virtual reality concepts. And we'll be using the Spark AI Studio to do some of the demonstrations. Okay, so if you haven't, can download the materials here at this QR code and link. Okay. Some self-introduction. Um, I'm Francis. I'm a year four computer engineering student, and I'm part of the, the hackers core team. And a little bit, a little bit by myself, I enjoy participating in hackathons. Yeah. If you scan this QR code of me, it leads to my Pila account. <laughs> yeah. This is my Telegram display picture, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So um, at any point of time, right, during the presentation, right, if you have any questions, right, just ask, okay? Because um, I think it's better for you to just stop the class and ask before you spiral into endless confusion, okay? okay? Yeah, so outline, kind of simple. Basically, introduction, the theory, and then we'll do some demonstrations. So virtual reality. So what is virtual reality? So um, in essence, virtual reality is this uh, concept of occluding your vision and putting yourself into this virtual space. So how do we do this? is by using typically these headsets that occlude you from the, the real world. So it put you in this virtual environment. Yeah, so you might have seen uh, movies like uh, Ready Player One, at the bottom left, where the main character, the protagonist, is put into this virtual space. Yeah, so uh, in the middle here, this is what you typically see from the, the view of the headset. So they have uh, split screens, each screen differing by a, a bit so that the input to both eyes is slightly different. This is to give you the depth, the illusion of depth when you view the virtual world. Yeah, so um, these headsets they typically cost like uh, typically cost like two, three hundred dollars nowadays. Yeah, consumer consumer grade ones. Yeah, but um, you can get something like this, like this cardboard kind of headset that's like very cheap. It's like twenty thirty, I think. I got this free at some event. Uh. Yeah. But basically, it has something similar. Like they have these like, two uh, lenses that shape the, the screen. So you put your mobile phone inside, then it changes the view into something that feels like VR. Yeah, so this is like very cheap VR experience. So the, the problem with this like, is that, of course, it's very limited because it only allows you to track your head's rotation. So I'll go into tracking later. And why is it important? Yeah. So next we have augmented reality. So the most obvious case, uh, obvious use case of augmented reality that you're probably familiar with is Pokemon Go. So you know, like you use your handphone and then they overlay some Pokemons and then you run around, chase them, and then throw, throw the the Pokeball, Pokeballs. Yeah, I edit. Yeah. So it's just this simple overlay of information on the screen. So there are some attempts at headsets, or you might have heard of Google Glass, where they have this headset and a small prism where they uh, project digital images. So they will give you some information about the world, uh, maybe about your location, the time, uh, and so on and so forth. All good? Any questions so far? No, right? All good? Yeah, so like I said earlier, there's uh, this see-through element. So instead of virtual reality where it's called you're completely occluded, you can see into the real world be it through the headsets or through the handphone, and then it's just an overlay of um, digital content. Yeah, so that's, you might have heard of this, this new term called mixed reality, and how does it fit within virtual reality and augmented reality? So mixed reality is actually an extension of augmented reality, but beyond just having a simple overlay, you now also have spatial understanding of the environment. So they, they do this by having dedicated hardware like the Magic Leap on the left side and the HoloLens on the bottle center. So they, they have dedicated hardware to sense the environment through the use of um, infrared cameras. So they measure the depth of the environment and they create this special mesh, yeah, this special map around the, the user. So why is this important? This is important because now your digital objects can interact with the real world. So this is like a digital overlay in the real world. So if I'm for if you can create a, a map of the wall. Now if you throw, if, if you fire a digital bullet at the wall, the, di the digital bullet can collide with the, the wall in the real world. Understand? 
like this interaction. Uh. Previously, there was just an overlay, but now there's an overlay, but these overlays can interact with the real world. These headsets are pretty expensive, upwards of like 4K SGD. <laughs> yeah, and over here, we have got similar experiences, but using the handphone. So this is like one of the more um, recent developments in the mixed reality scene. So let me play it for you. So with just the input from the handphones, right, they're able to create the spatial mesh as well. But of course, it's not as accurate as the ones where we use the dedicated hardware with the infrared cameras. Because the, the camera on the handphone is much more limited. Yeah, but you still can get the same effect. And so you can see that we throw the balls onto the table and it can detect the table and can like interact with it. Yeah, I can roll around on the floor. Yeah, so quite 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 cool, right? Uh, I think it's quite cool. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna throw some jargon at y'all so that y'all will become um pros at VR. <laughs> yeah, so HMD uh, generally refers to head mounted display. So like I mentioned earlier, for virtual reality and augmented reality experiences, some of them have dedicated hardware where they are mounted on the head. Uh. So HMDs. So the Magic Leap and the HoloLens in the previous slides uh, are some examples of it. Then interpupillary distance is something that you would come across if you use uh, different kinds of headsets. So why is this important is because everyone has um, different width between their eyes. So when you have headsets, right, typically the cardboard has a fixed IPD. So you can only get a limited experience, whereas um, commercial grade head model displays have IPDs that are ch changeable. So you are able to modify and basically in increase your comfort level. And the field of view refers to how far to the, fa how far to the left, right, up and bottom you can see. So this is important because if you want to create an immersive experience, right, you don't want your experience to be cut off halfway. So for, the, for, for many years, this was one of the limiting factors for immersive experiences because the headsets couldn't project uh, holograms or digital objects within the field of view of humans. So like for our field of view, it's about I think, 135 degrees. Yeah, so currently the HoloLens has a field of view of about 70 degrees, I think, 60, 70 degrees. So you get a limited, limited uh, view. And when the digital objects leave this view, then they get cut off. So it breaks the emotion, ex immersive experience. Then you were like, oh, it's just a digital object. The end goal would be, oh, everything is so realistic. You know, wow, I can't differentiate this between the real world and the digital world. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the end goal, right? Next, uh, we have um, IMU, which is basically oh, no. initial unit, not unity, sorry. Yeah, so is this like a chip or sensor in your headset or your device that measures um, information such as acceleration, rotation, uh, and magnetism? Yeah, magnetism. So this really depends from your um, device, device on device, device to device. So next we have degree of freedom. Why do you need to measure magnetism? Oh, hey, I haven't, I haven't get that yet. Hey, but uh, why do we need to measure magnetism? So magnetism, you can get information about um, like your compass reading. So you can orientate your, your virtual objects to the real world more accurately because otherwise everything will be just localized to your environment when you start scanning the environment. I, 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 I'm scared that you are lost already. <laughs> are you lost? Are you not lost? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, so typically, right, with, with these headsets, right, these kind of like cheap headsets, you can only look around in the environment because they only have a uh, three degrees of freedom, so they only track your head because you're using the, the uh, accelerometers in your phone to make the illusion that you are in the virtual environment. So if you want to look deep, like, like walk forward or walk backwards or move left and right, you don't get the correct feedback. Like the visual elements don't react like they would in the real world. Like for example, let's say I'm holding this box in front of me. If I move to the left, then the box 
relative to my head is moving to the right. Yeah, you won't get this kind of experience if you have just three degrees of freedom. But with um, higher end phones, you would have six degrees of, six degrees of freedom and you would have that kind of experience. Uh, you would be able to move forward and then look closer at the 3D objects and move further away. And for the magnetism, um, I mentioned earlier, this allows the headset to be centralized towards the real world using the compass information. Yeah. So how to create immersive experiences? So this is quite an important concept because um, this is one of the challenges that make or break virtual reality or augmented reality. Basically, you want to have create an experience that people um, can relate to. You don't want it to be um, unreal. For example, let's say you watch a movie, right? If you see CGI um, objects in a movie, you'll be like, oh, that's fake. And it doesn't feel like it's realistic, right? Because maybe the rendering is very, very poorly done, or maybe the lighting is a bit different. So as long as it doesn't seem like it fits in the environment, then you'll break this illusion that it's real. So this is where CGI, computer-generated images would, would fail. And similarly, we also want to create the illusion that things are real in our virtual environments. So how do we do this? One way is to use visual cues, like I mentioned earlier. The elements in the, in the digital world right, should move as though they were in the real world. Okay. Okay, then next, um, we have audio cues where we use, we use um, how do I put it, the difference between what I hear in my left ear and my right ear to determine the position of objects. For example, like in, in a movie theater, right, you might have heard like those like Dolby surround sound kind of thing, right? Yeah, so they use spatial audio to make you feel like the object is actually emitting sound from a certain direction. So for example, let's say this box is emitting noise. So the sound will, re will reach my, my right ear before it reaches my left ear. So this slight difference can be picked up by humans to give us some additional information about the position of the this audio source. So this adds to the emotion effect. And um, lastly, haptic cues. This is a bit more uh, tricky. So haptic refers to vibrations. So uh, vibrations from where? Mostly it's during, uh, using the controllers. So for example, let's say I have a controller in the virtual experience and I reach out for, uh, to an object. It will, be the, it will be best if I can reach out and grab and feel the object is itself. Right? Because this is what I expect in the real world. I expect some touch, a sense of touch, or maybe some reaction when I interact with the object. So these kind of haptic cues add to the immersiveness of the experience. Okay? Okay. More jargon. I assure you these are quite important. So one important thing that we need to do uh, when trying to create virtual or augmented experiences, right, is to track the environment. So we somehow need to ground our immersive experiences, right, to the real world. So we do this by using the head tracking, like I mentioned earlier, or we can also track markers here. So basically, we, we use that marker as a point of reference to the real world, and then we overlay our digital objects onto it. Or we can track like an arbitrary plane for example, a table or a floor, and then we just overlay that, that uh, digital image. Yeah, so this markerless tracking, right, is a bit more difficult because uh, the, the plane itself might not have enough details for us to pick up and track. It's almost the same as marker tracking, but we are using different kinds of information to, to create the, the virtual plane where we put our virtual objects. Then next, um, we have head tracking that is typically used by the headsets. So we want to basically localize the position of the headset with respect to our digital environment. So we, we do this by either using external trackers to track and locate our headset, similar to how our GPS does it. So GPS, they use uh, satellites to triangulate the position. Similarly, they have external, in this um, outside in tracking, we use external trackers to tr localize our headset. 
in 3D space. And by localizing the, the position of the headset, then we can then move around in the virtual environment however we like. Okay? And once this tracking breaks, right, then we have no longer any information of our position with respect to the virtual world, and then everything just flies everywhere. Like, the virtual experience is, is ruined. So this is quite critical. One of the newer uh, pro progressions in virtual reality space is um, the use of inside-out tracking. So this is similar to mobile, mobile experiences where we, have using the, we are using a camera to track the, ex the external environment. So instead of having one camera on your phone, you now have multiple cameras on your headset. And then you are able to take pictures of the environment and then keep track of the environment. Yeah. Ah, more jargon. So how do we track the environment? We use key points, which are basically special features in the environment that we can use to localize a plane or an object. So I, I previously mentioned that we have got marker-based marker, marker tracking here and markerless tracking. So they both use this kind of um, a technique, which is basically to find the key points that are special that are unique enough to be able to track over a period of time. And by, by being able to track these points in real time, you can then extrapolate the position of this marker with respect to your, to your device. Yeah. Point cloud simply refers to the input data that comes through the infrared cameras of higher-end devices. And then a spatial mesh is something that I mentioned earlier, which is basically this overlay of, um, this overlay of the real world and how the computer represents this real world in the virtual space. Uh, oh. small question. So like the technology, like the specific ones that you use for this, like the techniques to see the key points would be uh, your stereo vision, for example, is that correct? Say again, stereo vision? Um, stereo vision refers to like having two, more than one camera, right? Yeah. Having two cameras yeah. and then being able to differentiate yeah. the depth, right? Um, not really true. You could do it with one infrared camera, yeah, but, and then detecting all of the point clouds. Uh, but for yeah, you could do it with one, one camera as well. But it's a lot more difficult. Yeah, with two cameras, you get the additional information of um, being able to calculate ac accurately the distance between your device and the and the object or the key point because you can do some trigonometry. Yeah, some trigonometry. Okay, can. Don't worry, guys. We are, we are ending it, guys. It's coming towards the end. This is all the boring stuff, right? Yeah, so <laughs> one more concept that I need you all to know is this concept of factors, which you all might have um, learned in secondary school. Huh? What? No, no, uh, no? <laughs> yeah, so it's basically this idea that you can represent coordinates in, in 3D space using three numbers. Can? Okay? And they've got direction. Okay? okay, cool. Okay, finally, guys, we made it. <laughs> Okay, so now I'll be going through like some of the uh, going through some of the demonstrations that I prepared for uh, Spark AR using Spark AR. So we can open up our Spark AR Studio, then you can start to have some fun stuff, and hopefully you'll learn something useful. Okay, y'all should see this. Oh, you actually see this. Sorry. Have you opened it up? Have you installed it? Can I get some feedback? <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope that you all have installed it, okay? So we're going to proceed. So we just create a project. Doo -doo -doo. And perhaps we can save it. Like some arbitrary name. Um, hacker school is good. Okay, so we got this arbitrary uh, scene, right? You you got this open new project, okay, nah? So I'll I'll be explaining to you like what are some of the different um, elements in in this in this software. Yeah, so over here on the left side, the top left, there's this scene view. Actually, can y'all see, nah? How do you increase the font? How do you increase the font size? Can I, 
Kan jag snicka? Och jag menar, kan du se kassa? Kan? Så det är scene view, where the um, the scene the scene view houses all of the elements that we have in our scene. So currently, we've got a device, then we've got camera, focal distance, a microphone. Yeah, so all of these are preset elements that are defined by the software. So what's important is that you can see how like the microphone, mic microphone and focal distance is nested under camera, and camera is nested under device. So there's this like a um, parent and child relationship, or objects we have sub objects, and these sub objects could have even more sub objects. Okay. Then um, over here, the main the the giant rectangle here. This is the viewport. So this is where you manipulate your elements in the three-dimensional space. So what I'm doing now, I'm holding right click to rotate the, the camera. So this might, might be a bit tricky if you are using a Mac. And if you have a mouse, it will help a lot. <laughs> do you have a mouse? Yeah, I mean, I, I could do it on my computer too, but on my, so my touchpad. But for Mac, it's a bit difficult. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good job, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I love Mac. Okay, so next, we've got this simulator here. So we've got this guy with this, with moving his head. So this is basically how your your um, effect will look like. So oh, I did I did this I didn't mention this earlier, but Park AR Studio is typically used for making augmented reality experiences um, like. Uh, filters that you can publish on Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. So you can use this next time for that use case. Yeah. So over here you can see how our effect will look like. La. You can use can change different faces by changing the the video feed at the left side. So you can even use your own camera. Yeah. Now you can see me right. Yeah, can? I can use a real camera too. Yeah, I'll probably be using, <laughs> I'll probably be using uh, the real camera a lot. <laughs> yeah, because I I'm unable to connect my phone to the my computer. Okay, so next we have got the inspector on the right side. Here. So the right on on the inspector, we can view the properties of the elements that we'll be creating later. So if you click on camera, you can see there's some transformation, blah, texture extraction, segmentation, not so important. We will go into this more later. And at the bottom left, we've got this panel called the assets panel. So we have not imported anything yet, but later all of our three models will be housed here. So maybe we can add our first asset, which is the primitive cube. So press add assets, then press import from computer. Then go into the models folder that I sent you. Anyone does not have access to the models folder? Yeah, so the models folder has like a bunch of models that I have downloaded and created for you. So we have to import the primitive cube dot glb. Can? Okay, I need to turn off the camera now. It's, it's a bit too intense for my computer. <laughs> okay. You're, so you all should see the primitive cube on the bottom left in the assets panel. You all see it? Real, real, real good, right? Yeah. So this is like basically like the hollow wall of AR and VR, which is basically to put a cube onto the screen. Okay. We're gonna be doing that. Okay. We're gonna drag and drop the primitive cube. Uh, as a child of the camera object. Can? Okay. As a child of the camera object. So that means you you drag it over the word camera. Then the, the word camera will be highlighted and you let go. Yeah. So now it's a child of the camera object. Can? Okay. And then you see the cube appear in your viewport. Are we all good? If if you all are, are lost or maybe just came, um you can raise your hand and then we will come down and help you out. Try could could you help? Okay. 
Thanks. Anyone else lost? Oh, okay, I, I will. Um, it's primitive cube. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. Hmm? oh, I think it's I think it's hidden because I don't know why your your this taskbar is a bit blocking. Uh. Oh, it's down there. Yeah, it's 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 typically below. I mean, you can also you can also drag and drop it from outside. You can like just uh, under downloads. Downloads. Yeah, I can extract it first. Okay, yeah, then you just drag and drop the primitive cube. Yeah. yeah. Just place it there. Can? Yeah, you still want to keep in. Then how you change the uh, Later, later. Hey, can you chill out? Later, 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 later. No, no, no. No, just keep there. Yes. Okay, hopefully everyone is like on the same page now. Everyone has this cube in the viewport. So you might be wondering like, oh, no. I mean, I've got the cube in the viewport, but I can't see it on my simulator. Dang. So, <laughs> first let's resize the the cube because it's a bit too big. So you can see in the inspector panel here, you can, you can have a, um, a look at all of the properties of the, the object that we have. Um, make sure that you're highlighting the primitive cube uh, on the left here. Okay? You, you got it selected. So we can make it invisible, visible, and animations. Then we can do some transformations to it. So let's change the scale of the cube to like 0.2. 0 0.2, 0 0.2, in all three axes, x, y, and z. Notice how if I, if I didn't change the y, the y value, right, then you'll be like a cuboid. Yeah, this is how you can manipulate the objects. Yeah, so if you want to scale everything down proportionally, then you just have all the same, all the same values in all three axes. Okay, so now we have a smaller cube, and we can zoom in by either scrolling the wheel on your mouse or you can zoom in like by pinching on your touchpad. Can? Everyone can comfortably move around the viewport. I hope so because this is quite a important step. Okay, so now we've got our smaller cube but we still can't see it, right? The reason being is because our camera is currently positioned at 0, 0, 0 in our virtual space. And so is our prim primitive cube. And if you s if we look here, they have this like um, rectangle here, right? So this re rectangle basically represents um, what the camera can see. So maybe I can bring back the, the dude, this dude. Okay. Yeah, so you can see, even though the video itself is much bigger, but we can only see a small portion of it, like a portrait rectangle. If we change the phone size, right, into like, or we change the simulator size to like a resizable window, we can actually change the view of the camera and can see more or less, more or less of the guy. Okay, I'm just gonna change it back to iPhone 8 because that's like the default. Okay, all got that. But we still can't see our cube, right? Oh my goodness, that's terrible. Okay, let's drag the, drag the blue color arrow towards the screen. Okay, can? So now you can see that like the cube is within our view of the camera and we can see it on the simulator. Here, simulator here. Can? But currently it looks like a square, right? It doesn't really look 3D to, to us. So we, we can add some rotation to it. So maybe 45 degrees on the x-axis and 45 degrees on the y-axis. And now it looks like a Real 3D object. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, so how you move the, 
the, the box itself. You can move, you can change its position by moving the arrows here, the red, blue, or green arrows, or you can move them in the plane, along the plane. Like for example, now I'm moving it in along the XZ plane, the blue and red plane, by holding this triangle, uh, not triangle, rectangle, or square. Yeah, can? And you can also change how you manipulate the object. Let's say I want to manipulate the rotation. I can press this button here on top. top. I can change it. Can you see? I'm pressing this button here on top. Here. And now I can rotate my object however I like. Yeah, instead of manipula manipulating the values in the inspector. And I can similarly change the scale here as well. Wow. Okay. But I'm just going to change everything back to what it was earlier. Okay, I think this is fine. Yeah, so now let's try to export this onto our mobile devices so that we can like, you know, make sure everything in the pipeline works. So if you got your phone cable with you, right, and if, if you got the Spark AR player on your phone, you can press this button to test your application, test on device. Yeah, make sure that your phone is connected to your, your, your computer and ensure that your debugging mode is on. Can? So you should see your, your phone appear out here. I can't really display this for you uh, because I don't have, I can't plug in my cable because I only got one USB-C port. Yeah, so you should see your device appear here. If you don't have your, your cable, all is not lost, you can press send to app. Then you can create a link that will link to your Facebook camera. So you press send, then they will generate a file for you to preview on your phone, uh, a link for you to preview on your phone. Yeah, so if you press send, all right, then there's this test link. Then you can copy this test link. All following still, copy the test link. And then you can um, send this test link to yourself using your favorite messaging application, i.e. WhatsApp, Telegram, email, I don't know what else, line. Okay, so I send myself this link, right? Then I can look at it from my phone. Where's my phone? Yeah, so on your phone, you should see like something like this, like a website, then just press open Facebook camera, and hopefully you'll be able to see the cube, hopefully. Okay. Anyone has having trouble getting this? What? Your cube should be here. You should see something similar to what you see on the simulator. Yeah. Basically, the cube being in front of you. Make sure that the cube is a child of the camera. Yeah. Can? If you, if you still? Yeah. yeah, if you can't see the cube, you might want to try to close the application and reopen it using the link. If you're using the Spark AR player, right? Yeah, you just need to open the link. But if you're using a Spark AR player, if you press um, test application, right, you'll just send it to the app, the player itself. Yeah, so you skip the step of having to click the link. Mm. Okay, so you you got a cube. I oh, got a cube. Yeah. You have got a cube. Oh, I don't have the cable. Oh, you don't have the cable. I said I told you can. Yeah, it's in Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Yeah, you can send the link to yourself. Everyone got to this stage. You send it to yourself using your favorite messaging application, i.e. Telegram, WhatsApp, Line, Viber, what else? 
WeChat la. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that all of us have made it here. So congratulations, you have uh, made your first augmented reality experience. Nah, it's not very cool, right? It's just like a lame, <laughs> lame cube. And again, it doesn't have like the, it doesn't behave like what we expect it to behave. How how it, we expect it to behave? It's just a cube that's overlaid on our on our screen. So when we move our our camera left, it doesn't it doesn't move to the right. It just follows the camera. It's just a simple overlay. So that's kind of lame, right? So we want to manipulate the 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 cube. So how do we do that? Okay, so. So, one thing that we can do, right, is that we can try to change the, the, the position of the cube. Like, we can move it to the right if our camera moves left, and move it to the left if our camera moves right. Right? So, we can create this thing called a patch. So, enter patch. So, open your, go to view. Then open the patch editor. Okay? Or press Ctrl Alternate P. If you are a Mac, it will not be Ctrl Alternate P. It will be something else. Yeah, so once you've got the patch editor, right? You got this nice view. So this is how we're gonna like add behavior to our objects. No coding. <laughs> okay? So Everyone good? Everyone good? Everyone good? So if you right click on the patch editor, right, we can get we can get um different kind of patches that uh, we can use here. Blah 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 blah. Okay? But what we want is the device motion patch. Okay? Device motion patch. So you open up the patch editor, um, what do you call this? Insert patch view using right click. Right click and then you type in device motion. Then you should be able to see this. Then you can just click it and then you'll appear. Boom. Okay. Then if we want to view the values inside this um, patch, we can open the patch, insert patch uh, view again and type in value. So you should see something like this. Okay. So let's try to connect. Oh, you right click, then you type in value on the search. Yeah. yeah. Can. So let's try to connect our device motion to value. So you can see that this patch, the output is three D rotation. So it's this. This is three D rotation of our phone. Can. So we try to connect it. Okay. And we get a value of 5.299 for, for me. I don't know what about you. You are made, made to this stage? Yeah, those of you who are sharp, you all would re have realized that three rotation is represented in three axes. And currently we only see one value. So what's up? Yeah, we, we kind of messed up here. So we should change this to vector three. Again. Y'all will have seen this, right? So press, select the, the value patch, then select, click on number, then select vector 3. Ah. Yeah, vector 3. Then now we can see more values. Yeah. Can, can you see? Yeah, so these values are directly coming from your mobile phone, as in your simulated mobile phone, on the simulator here. right hand corner here, we can select simulate orbit. So when we, cl when we click and drag on the simulator, we're actually simulating, rotating the camera. Can? So you can see that the, the, the camera object in our viewport also moves along. Can? Can? Our cube is still, however, moving along with the camera. And this is because 
we put it as a child of the camera. Yeah. Can? So when we move our camera left, right, we actually want the cube to move to the right. Okay? So let's try to do that. So, let, so the, on the primit primitive cube, let's uh, click this button next to the word rotation. Okay? Then you get a new patch here. New patch. Okay? So now this new patch, right? It takes in a value, it takes in a vector, a 3D vector, and it outputs it to whatever value we, we set here. Okay? So you connect this. Then you, you'll see that like your Q's position has jumped a bit. Because now you're taking values directly from the, the gyroscope itself. Okay? So how this reads, right, is that the value from the device, the 3D rotation of the device, is being parsed into this patch called value. And then this patch does nothing to the, the, the values. It just houses it. And then it parses it out to the primitive cube. The primitive cube's 3D rotation. So you can see it here, highlighted. Okay? So if we move our, our screen, right, if we orbit our device, we can see that our cube also rotates. But then it doesn't rotate like we expected. Right. Have, have, have we made it to this stage? Oh. You have any problem? Oh, okay, I can help you. I have to create and then it comes right. Oh, I um, couldn't get from there. Um, you just need to quick right click here. Yeah. Right click and you type in device motion. Yeah, and then you get the patch for device oh. motion. Okay. Then you can similarly do this for value. Value and other. Okay, and and other value. Yeah. Okay, this uh, this one right. I sent yeah. it, but I'm not able to see it here. I'm not sure why. So y um, you s you send the fresh. It sends again, right? Did I send a notification to you? Uh, this time. So so it it's, it sends a, a link. Yeah. So you've got a link, right? It's holding too far. Yeah. Right? So so just hold on. So you open this link. Mm -hmm. Then you copy this link, mm -hmm. and you s and you send this to yourself, maybe through WhatsApp or something. Okay. Yeah, then you open that link on your phone. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it automatically sent a pop-up oh, earlier. Yeah. yeah, for yeah. Facebook, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, so you can press this. Press this. And... Uh, oh, you need to update your app application. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, do you have um, a Wi-Fi connection here? Yes, I have what's what, so... Oh, okay. yeah, then you can you just update, maybe. Uh, or, or do you have the Spark AR application? Oh, yeah. Okay. No, it's in the Spark AR application on the phone, oh like in your Play Store. Oh yes, I at the App Store. Yeah, I it can see from there, right? Yeah, I can see from there. So okay. then you don't have to use the Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone? Anyone else? Spark? Oh. What? Huh? Oh, you you press the the arrow next to the word rotation. Well, you so you select the cube first on, on the. And then you press the rotation, the arrow. Yeah, there you get. Can? Okay. Is everyone good at this point? All good? All good? All good? Okay, let's continue. Uh, okay, so we move our 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 screen right, and then we move the cube. And the cube moves along with us, but it kind of like it's not really behaving like how we want it to behave, right? So the reason this this is so is because currently the pivot of rotation of the cube is is shown by this. This uh, axis, these three axes. So if you do any rotation, right, you'll rotate by the about the axis. So let's say I break the connection. Or if I just delete, then now I can rotate the cube, but the cube rotates about this 
sphere. So how do we make it rotate about the axis of the phone? So we, we can do this by creating another object. We, let's create a now object. So you right-click camera, right-click add, or click add, then click now object. So now you have a now object here. And let's drag the primitive cube into the null object. So now the primitive cube is a child of the null object, and the null object is a child of the camera. Okay? Yeah, so we can see now that when we select the null object, right, its sphere, that which represents the axis of rotation, is currently at 0, 0, 0, which is the same position as our camera. Can you see? Previously, it was here, like on the screen, and now it's now it's behind. Okay, so we have changed the axis of rotation. So now perhaps we could now let's rename this now object. Let's rename it to cube parent. You can name it whatever you want. Okay, then I'm going to create a new patch. Selecting the cube parent, I'll create a three D rotation patch for the cube parent. Then I will connect it to, to my device motion's va value. Oh? Oh. Who? Oh. Who? 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 Oh. Vector. Hmm? Vector? Vector three. Like, every time I click, then the lens drops. Like the lens didn't click. What? <laughs> it's going on with your computer. <laughs> what is going on with your computer? Let me just delete the patch. Delete the patch. Right click. Oh, I don't know. What is a Mac exit? Yeah. Exit Mac. Kidding. I love Mac. Okay. Let's try this. What is going on? Okay, your Mac problem. Uh. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, maybe you want to try to restart the application? Yeah, you save this first. Uh. Save this first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but actually it's not very critical because you can just delete this, this value, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can just directly link to the rotation of the cube. So let's say I got a rotation patch here, right? I don't have to link the value, I can just link this value. But I can't, I can't find it, where's the value? Okay, here. Ah, here. Just link it directly. Yeah, just link it directly. It's, it's okay. Yeah, just that, just that you can't manipulate the values. I can't see the values now. Yeah, so you can just do this for now. Yeah, or you can try to... I don't know, it's just a... I don't know, the computer's weird. Uh, you press this hamburger. Yeah, simulate orbit. Simulate orbit. Yeah. Oh. Now you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, can. Yeah. Can. Okay. So if y'all couldn't like, if for some reason right your your value patch doesn't work right. If for, some, if for some reason you couldn't change the 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 type of the value to be vector three, okay, you can just delete it and then just connect it directly. The value patch was just for us to visualize what are the values inside the device motion. But I mean, you can, you, you can also see it here, la, So it's it's fine. It's not very critical. And also, um, make sure when you want to move around the camera, right? Use simulate orbit instead of simulate touch. So now we are simulating moving the camera around. And then if you simulate touch, then you're just pressing around on the screen. Can? Yeah, so now simulate. Whoa. Whoa. And yeah, so now if we move left, if you drag the, the camera left, right, we, we, we should see that the cube moves right. And if we drag our camera right, we should see that the object 
moves left. So you can see this inside the viewport here, that the cube seems to be like staying in the same position, right? As opposed to following the camera just now. Okay? So this like sort of using the gyroscope's um, information and using it to change the position of the cube with respect to our camera's position and thereby creating this illusion that it is in real space and not moving. Like hovering. Huh? What? <laughs> okay, can? Moving. Yeah, so it's like, it's as if it's in real space. Oh, let me try to show it to you all using the camera here. Oh, it doesn't really show here. Yeah, so if you export this onto your on your phone, right, you should see something that doesn't work. <laughs> the reason being is because the values that are mapped from the device motion to the cube itself, right, they are not calibrated per se. So even though you still can see some of the illusion here, right, but it's not exactly perfect. Yeah, so actually you can get the same illusion, right, by just moving the cube parent outside of the, ca the camera. That means you make it a root of the device instead of a root of the, of the camera. Oh no, you make it a root of the scene instead of the device. Can? Then you can delete all of this. And delete all of this. And then you can reposition your, your cube. Reposition your cube. Into the scene. And then you will still act as, 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 as before. Yeah. Have you ever done this? Currently? Did this? Yeah, so I, I moved, I deleted everything from, from the patch editor. Okay. <laughs> I deleted everything, and I moved the object outside of the camera. So previously, the reason why it was following the camera was, it was because the cube was a child of the camera. So no matter how we move the camera, it would just follow the position of the camera. The reason why we were able to make it move for a second just now by using the patch editor was that we mapped the value of the camera to the rotation of the cube. But we will not, we will not get the correct effect in reality because um, there's some values to tweak. Like for example, let's say um, I do one rotation of my camera, it's not equivalent to one rotation of the cube. Yeah, so you need to do some calibration, which is done for you by Spark AR if you just drag it out of the camera object. Yeah. So you get the same effect. And if you build this project, you should be able to see the cube hovering in space. So let's, re let's reset the camera. Reset camera. Okay, then um, let's try to, to test this application. Make sure that you have something similar here. Huh? Make sure that you have the device, and then you've got the cube outside of the device, and you can see the cube on your simulator. Are we all okay? Okay, then we can just test application, test on device. Then again, if you've got your Spark AR player working, you can just send to connect the device. You can click your device here, or you can do the same old, same old thing and test it on your Facebook camera. So you can send it to your Facebook camera. And you get a new link, then you can copy your link to your favorite messaging application. And then you can send it to yourself, and you can view it on your phone. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of links. Yeah. Anyone still stuck? Anyone doesn't know how to send messages to yourself? Can you email to yourself? Yeah, so, it, yeah, so if for some reason I can't see the cube, right, you can either rotate the camera around, because maybe you position the, the cube behind you, or maybe when, you're, when you loaded the scene, the cube instantiated behind you. So if I want to look around, or you can just restart the application, and it should land in front of your camera. Okay, everyone has the cube hovering.
Okay. So you you tested you. Just now the the first one we the first can try again ten thirty five. So you can how do I go back? Go back go up. Ah uh, okay I think I think he's done. Oh wait. Hmm. Where is it? Wait, let me find it. I don't know. Should should be working ah. Uh. Where is it? <laughs> Try to find it. Where is oh yeah, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's here, it's here, it's here. I told you, you find it. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, it's just there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's there, it's somewhere here. <laughs> yeah, you just have to find it. And you can change it. In, you can change the position. Um, perhaps if you reset the camera. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why. But I mean, it's not very critical because we're going to be doing other things later. So it's okay. Like, okay. Now we just see the cute candy. Uh, oh, I think okay. it's fine. <laughs> yeah, because we'll be doing more of this. So it's okay. Okay, I can go and be like. Cute parent is just a null object. It's just, um, just so so that we can um translate the cube in the x y and z plane. Because previously we we rotated the the cube object right by forty five degrees in the x axis and forty five degrees in the y axis. So now it messed up our translation axis. So now it just for us to make it easier for us to translate in the x y and z, we just wrap it around in a null object. Okay, so so the axis, right? It's basically so the cube is in the same position, but when you press the different uh, levels, right? Um, they are just the position of those objects that are a, a sub object of each. How do I how do I put it? Ah. Yeah, so over here, right? This object is a sub is a sub object of this one. Right. So if you translate this object, you're translating everything that's below. Okay. Okay. So currently, I mean, I don't know what this value. Yeah. So basically, you can move any of these, <coughs> these um, okay. vectors, right, to move if the cube. Let's say I wanna find it on my device, right? Uh huh. The cube should be following the cube parent axis, um, or following all the way to the bottom. It doesn't matter in this case, cause we just want the cube to be in three D space, right? Yeah. Correct. So the reason why I can't see the cube now is actually because your cube is behind the, the this panel. Okay. Actually, okay. Okay, can see lah. Just put it here lah. Let's put it nearer to here. Yeah. So when you move around the camera, right? You see that it stays in the same position. Okay, so it must always be in front of the panel itself. Doesn't have to be lah. Actually, it seems like it still works there. Eh? Is it? Then how? how yeah, because okay. we don't see it just now. When okay, you try to play. Yeah. Just run it. Actually, it should be fine, lah. Actually, behind, I think you still can see it. Eh? I think you still can see it. But just very small. Oh, yeah, maybe you can change your flip the camera. Wait, let me how you find it. Where is it? Oh, it's there. It's, it's here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Look at your left, your left, your left. <laughs> yeah, can can see it. <laughs> oh, you still can't see it. Uh, I think we've lost the. Uh, oh, that's a cube. So okay. Clear from where okay. Yeah. Let's. So you don't have. You don't need this anymore. You delete this. You delete this. You delete this. Okay. Yeah. So we just need to move the object into our scene. So previously, the the reason why the cube doesn't move is because it's following the position of the camera. Cause it's a child of the camera. Mm -hmm. You can see here, right? It's a child of the camera. So I want to move it out of the okay. outside. Uh, yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. So now the camera is here, mm -hmm. and then the cube is outside, mm -hmm. and it is part of our scene. Uh. Mm -hmm. okay. So where's the cube? I have no idea. Where do you put it? Yeah. Where is it? That's the one. Where is where, where is the cube? I can't see the cube. Oh, you put it invisible? Um, not really. Huh? Eh. Let's see. Oh, okay. What happened to your cube? <laughs> okay. Still point two only. Oh, okay. What happened to your cube? Why <laughs> is your cube so humongous? What happened to your cube? 
Maybe you can re-import the cube again. Yeah. Two cube. Okay. Yeah, that was the correct size. <laughs> yeah, so we just need to position it. We should resize it first. Okay. And now we can just. So now we can see it in the in the scene, right? Uh -huh. And when we simulate orbit. Oh, it's still following. Oh no, I put it as a child of the. Let me put it outside. Okay, then now I position back inside the viewport. So I can see it there. Then when I move my camera, uh -huh. it, it feels like it's hovering. Uh, yeah, so when you export this onto your phone, you should be able to see the same effect. Okay. Yeah. yeah but uh, let, let's, let's rotate this. How do you change this color from grey to some other color? Okay. I, 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 I can angle it together with the class. Okay. Yeah. Can? Okay, I, I, I hope that you all have um, figured some stuff out. If you all need help, you can just raise your hands. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so someone asked, um, oh, yes. so someone asked, like, how do you change the color of the cube? So if you select the cube here, right, if you venture deep enough into the cube, you can see that this, there's this thing called nodes underscore zero. So this object is named this way because the guy who created the 3D object used some software which named it like that, i.e. me. I used Paint 3D to make this cube. <laughs> yeah, so you can change the material of the object by, by looking at the inspector, then you can see materials here. Then you can create new material. Okay? Create new material, then you, you will see on the assets tab, you will now have a material zero under the materials folder. Okay? We can rename this material, let's rename it uh, cube material. Okay? Name it cube material. Then we can change the color of the cube by changing the color here. Here, diffuse, under diffuse. Let's change it to red. Nice red. Okay, la, let's, let's, do, let's do pink. La. Or purple, or purple. <laughs> okay, now I got a nice purple cube. Do you all have a nice purple cube? Do you have a nice cube? Can? Are you able to change color? Yeah, this is not very essential, but it's just that if you want to, you know, how, know how to like beautify your, your, your cube for some reason. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, next we're going to do something more fun, okay? We're going to add some like uh, interaction to our, our scene. So how do we interface with our augmented world using our, our mobile phone, right? And our mobile phone can take in some input, basically screen, screen taps or dragging the screen around. So in our patch editor, we can do this by right-clicking and then we can search for the screen, screen tap patch. Okay, boom, insert patch. Okay, now we've got this screen tap patch. Okay, so now the, the goal right that we're trying to, to achieve here is that we're trying to map the screen tab to reposition the cube. Okay? So let's let's uh, reposition the cube to be let's say zero zero negative zero point four. And you all should see it roughly in the center of the screen. Is it okay? Zero, zero, negative zero point four. Why these values? No particular reason. Yeah, it's just because it looks like this. <laughs> so that you all can follow along. Okay? So um, again, we will try to look at the values of the screen tab. Let's have let's open the value the value patch again, value patch. And this time, because it's a 2D position, we only need to use vector two, okay? Vector two representing two numbers, okay? Then when we click around, uh, when we click um, the hamburger menu and click simulate touch, now we see like our cursor change, right? 
on the simulator. If we click around, we should see the values in the value patch change. Can you all see it change? You all see it? the values here change? Are you sure? Don't take my word for it, okay? Remember to connect the screen tab patch to the value patch. Then you can see the values here. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Cannot find the cube. It's okay, ah. You can always just work in the simulator, it's, it's fine. You don't have to look at it in the real world. Yeah, at this point. It's just a cube, right? It's not very exciting yet. Okay, so we want to map our finger, finger click right to the position of the cube. So, so now my, oh, oh, let me change this. Sorry, I should have changed the cube parents transform to zero zero negative zero point four. Oh, why is it gone? I guess zero point four. Oh no. Yeah, I messed up somewhere. Oh. Okay. Just move it here. Okay, not, not very important. I just move it inside the screen. <laughs> okay, um, next, we will want to map the value of x here in our screen tab to the x-coordinate, the x-axis of our cube. Um, make sure that your axis right is aligned with the, the screen. So you can see, I, I kind of messed up. So my cube is like in some weird position now because of all the rotations I did. Let me try to reset the rotations. Or let me just import the cube again. Uh. Sorry, guys, I messed up. I hope that y'all will learn from my mistakes. Yes. Okay. Okay, I, I've got no idea why, but my camera is facing the wrong way. I'm going to move it. Okay. Now it's straight. Yeah, so remember to straighten your camera, okay? Then we're going to move the, the cube closer to the screen. Okay, 0 0.4. Huh? Then we can uh, let me rotate my cube. Do, 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 do. Okay. Can. So now when we look at our cube, right, we should be able to see this axis, right, the x axis and the y axis. Can. And we should also be able to see like where is the, the limit, what is the leftmost limit of my cube. So the left, leftmost limit of the cube um, is roughly about 0 0.08. Around here. So remember that number, okay? 0 0.08. Then the rightmost limit is like negative 0 0.16. 0 0.08, negative 1.16. Yeah, okay? So we want to map the values that we get. So our leftmost, when we tap the leftmost screen, right, we get like 80 on the x value, x value here. I'm looking at the x value here. When we tap on the left side, we get about 80-ish, I think. Yeah, 80-ish, yeah. And on the right side, we get about 
600. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm eyeballing this, by the way. Eyeballing this, okay? So let's um, grab another patch called um, Unpack. So this Unpack patch, right, allows us to manipulate the individual numbers that we get from our vector, vector 2. So previously, we can only handle the vector 2 as this collection of two numbers. But now we want to manipulate each number, the x and y coordinate individually. So we use this unpack patch. Then we connect the value to our unpack patch. Also, we need to change the unpack patch value to vector 2 as well. Okay. So now we have extracted the x and y values. Okay. Yeah, if you tap on the screen, you can still can see the values update here in real time. Yeah, now we, sorry guys, it's just going to be a lot of patches and patches and patches, okay? But we are trying to build up your confidence in using patches. So the next patch we're going to use is this patch called from range. So you can see that there's the description here. It maps the given value from the specified range to 0 to 1 inclusive. Okay? So previously, we, uh, we measured that the value of the screen tab ranges from uh, 80, yeah, 80, 80 to 680, okay. Okay, so we're gonna put it here, 80 to 680. And then we're gonna connect, we're gonna connect the X value from the unpack patch into the first value on the from range patch, okay? So now the output value right will be scaled down to zero to one. Okay, and we must scale this value from zero to one now to a value that can move the cube from negative uh, from zero from zero point zero eight to negative zero point one six. This is just math. Okay, if you are not um, confident in your math. Okay, just follow along. Are you all able to follow so far? Sorry, I didn't get to check in with you all. Okay. So you want to map the value, okay? So we will create... Okay, let's just create the patch for position of the cube parent first. Okay, this is our angle. We want to update the values of the cube parent here such that it changes on the screen. Okay, this is our angle. Ah. Sorry, it's a bit hard to see here. So now the value that we get from from range is zero to one, and we want to map it to negative. Uh, what's it again? We want to map it to oh. Oh, so once I create the the cube parent, I cannot modify the position of the the cube in my viewport anymore because now it's being determined by the patch itself. So I, I guess I have to delete it to measure again. Okay, for the last time, I'll remember this for now. I'll remember this. Okay, 0 .8, 0 0.08 to negative 0 0.16. Okay, so that's the difference of 0 0.24, correct? Like from 0 0.08 to negative 1.6, a uh, negative 0 0.16. So that's a range of 2.4. 2 yeah, 2 yeah, 2.4. <laughs> okay, so we use the multiply patch. Multiply patch. So we want to get our number that ranges from 0 to 1 to 0 0.24. 0 0.24. Yeah. So now the value ranges from... Okay, you can, I add the value patch here. Then you can see. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> so currently when I touch the left side of the screen, the value is zero or negative zero. Uh. Negative zero point something. Then as I move towards the right side, it moves towards zero point two four. Okay? 
but this is not what we want, right? So we want to get from negative 0 0.08, no, 0 0.08 to negative 0 0.16. So um, let's minus, so we just subtract. A lot of patches, right? So we connect this here, subtract it by, what is it? Shit, math. Zero point zero eight. Yeah. Then now we drag the subtract to here. So now we get negative zero point zero eight to zero point one six. Okay, we are still wrong because we wanted the negative of that, right? So we can either multiply again. Oh, oh now I should have subtracted another value. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to... I'm going to, to do the same thing as just now. Just, I'm just going to add another multiply fetch, okay? Yeah, because I can't do my math <laughs> properly. Oh no. Okay. So I multiply my negative one, and then we get our value. Okay, great. So now we got, neg like got 0 0.08 from here. Then now, as we move to the right side, it's negative 0 0.16. Oh, finally. Okay. Then now we want to pack the values together. So we so just now we unpack the values, right? Now we want to pack it back. So we use the pack patch. Okay. Pack patch. Oh, pack patch. Pack patch. Then we will map it to the x axis, uh, the x value of the pack. And then we will create our cube parents position patch here. Then we connect it to here. Notice how now the cube parents position takes the value of the pack pack patch output. That's a mouthful. And now it's outside of our viewport because now we have set the value of the z axis to be zero. So we want to change that back to 0, um, 0 0.4. So we add the value patch, then we put in 0 0.4. Oh, shit, no, we can just key it in here. We can just key it here, 0 0.4. Yeah. So now we should see it on the screen. Yeah. So are you all able to get this behavior? Now we can, now the, the cube follows my cursor through my glorious math. <laughs> Some good math right here. Yeah, but the idea is that you map the values of the, the, the touch, the touch, the tap on the screen to the values of the cube. Okay? But this still only works for the x-axis, and the y-axis doesn't work. We could do the same thing for the y-axis. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm not sure if you all want me to bore you with that. You, you, want, you want to do for y-axis also? You want to do that? Okay, I guess not. <laughs> I guess it's a resounding no. Yeah, but now you can try this on your phone and see how it works. Like if you tap on the phone, see if the cube follows your, your finger. It might not work because here I'm using the iPhone 8 as a device. So for you, you might have used, I don't know, an iPhone X or something. Then maybe your screen is bigger. Yeah. But you'll get the idea, right? That you map the values of the screen tap to the position, the x-axis of the cube. Similarly, you can do the same thing for the y-axis and get the same effect. Okay? Okay, next we're going to do something more special. Because our, our cube is kind of like lame, it's like static, right? So we want to like give some life to it, like add some animation to it. So we're going to right click, we're going to use the loop animation patch. I hope you are still, uh, still following. 
I know it's, it's tough. But at least there's no coding, right? <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I just thought, silver lining. You know. Okay, so we've got this loop animation patch here, right? And um, let's see what happens if we link it to our output here. So what we're going to do right, right now is we want to move the cube towards the guy as if we are throwing the cube at him. Okay, we just want to move, modify the z-axis. Okay. So to do that, we want to use this add patch. So previously, we had a value of 0 0.4 that's fixed, right? So we want to modify this value. So let's say I put in 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Yeah, now it moves towards the, the man, 0. Point, no, 0. Point 0.9. If our initial value of 0 0.4, we want to add the value of the loop animation. So this loop animation, this um, value progress, it ranges from 0 to 1, and it just loops. Okay, it just loops, like a clock. Just loops around, 0 to 1. So when we add this, and we connect it to our patch, we can see that our cube is moving. Right? Wow, this um, is so cool, right? <laughs> yeah, so you can modify the, the speed of it by using the multiply patch. Like I said earlier, the value changes from 0 to 1, right? So now you can make it from 0 to 1 to, let's say, 0 to 5. Then you can see the cube move faster. Whoa! Okay? But we want to like, we don't let, let it like behave on its own. So we want to only fire when we tap the screen. So you notice how there's this tap output from the screen tap patch. We can drag it to the reset of the loop animation patch. Then whenever we, we tap the screen, it will reset the loop animation. Why, why, did someone laugh? Yeah, okay, can. So now it, it looks like we are firing some cubes. Yeah, but it still loops. So we want it to fire and then not loop. And only execute when we press the, 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 the screen. So how do you do this? We will do this by doing more patch magic. Okay. So you can see right, that the value just keeps increasing, right? So let's create this if then else patch that allows us to implement some logic into our system. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so the, the if that's if the, the if then else patch requires a condition. So we will add a condition patch. Let's put greater than. Then we will take the value from multiply and we will put it into greater than. So if the value of um, if the value of the output of multiply is greater than let's say three, then we will trigger this if then else condition. This if then else patch, and its output we will then give it to the add. Okay. So if it's greater than three, then we set the value to be like nine 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 nine. Okay. So when it's nine 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 nine, it's out of the screen. All right. Understand so far? It's out of the screen. If it's not less than three, if it's not greater than three, then we just return it to its original value. So we take the output from multiply, and we drag it to the else statement here. Can? So now the output from multiply goes into two places. Okay? It goes into the greater than patch and the if then else patch in the else statement. But 
but it's still looping, right? Because um, our value still loops from 0 to 5. So let's increase this number to like 100 something. Oh, maybe it's too fast, uh. I can't really see it. No, a bit too fast. Oh. Okay, let's put this value at 100. Okay. And our loop animation is currently like looping really quickly, so let's increase the duration to 100. So the value here will change from 0 to 100. 0 to 1 in 100 seconds. Okay? So now we can see that our cube behaves like we want it to behave. Can? It's moving very slowly towards the man. Okay? Can? Are you able to get this? Yeah, so if we had done the y axis part, like, you know, change the position of the cube's y axis according to our screen, then we would have be able to change the position of the cube more. Okay? I hope that you all are somewhat following. Okay, I think most of you all are lost probably. <laughs> because this patch is kind of like a monster, right? Like you see. Yeah, it's kind of a monster of a patch. Yeah, so um, this was actually just to give you like a brief introduction to like what kind of logic that you can program into the this application without any coding. Yeah, so you can actually do coding in this system. Like you can write JavaScript. But I mean, I think it's quite cool to make this circuit-like diagram too. Yeah, it, it really works like a circuit. Like there's uh, input, like pulses. Or you can consider it like a, I don't know, a, what do you call it? An input, a voltage. Like you know in circuits, you got like the volts, right? Yeah, it's like the electrons are like going through the circuit. So that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you can take like a short break. Then I'll go through more demonstrations. Because this one is like, uh, it's just fun, right? But it's not very useful in our, our lives. So <laughs> I'll go through more useful things in our lives. Okay. Maybe you can take like a five minute break. We can uh, come back at like 2.38. Then I'll start slightly promptly at 2.38, can? Yeah, then um, if you are still lost, you can just raise your hand and then we'll get you up to scratch. You don't have to follow this exactly, okay? This is just a, like a demonstration to show you like the different kind of patches that we can use. So we have used unpack to unpack the data from 2D, from the 2D vector. So we can ma manipulate the individual uh, values. And now we can scale the values from, from a specific range to 0 to 1, then we can do some complicated math and then map the values to the screen, okay? And then get this kind of effect. Can? Do you, do you all want this thing? I can save this for you all and then I can send it to you all. You want this? Okay, I, I'll just save it. Okay, I'll save it as... Uh, I'll save it as... Throwing cube demo. Okay? Or shooting cube demo. Ah, whatever. I'll save this. Okay, uh, let's uh, guys take take a break. Just yeah, chill. Uh, if, if you have got problems, you can raise your hands. I will come by. Any problems? Lost? Very lost? Okay. <laughs> I I assure you, it gets simpler. Yeah, it, this this is as bad as it gets. If and else. But how does the if else statement work? Yeah, so um basically So the loop animation thing, right? Uh -huh. It outputs a value from zero to one, correct? Okay. And it takes and it runs for one second, right? Currently. Yeah. So what I did was that I I increased this value to one hundred. So okay. now it increases from zero to one in hundred seconds. Mm. Okay? So that right. Then I also multiply this by one hundred. So now the value that comes out for multi multiply right is like one every second. So the first second is one, second second is two, third second is three. Yeah, I'm huh? Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, so it outputs here. 
Yeah. Um, then, if the value the output here right, is greater than, let's say, twenty, right? Twenty. Mm. Twenty. Then we will use. So, how to put it? We assume that the the bullet, the cube is out of the screen, and we just, we just want to like make it invisible because we don't want it to be so small and then like some yeah. weird thing. Yeah, so, so we just set it to be zero. Oh, no, set it to be like nine, 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 nine. So this puts it out of the screen. Ah, okay. So currently it's out of the screen, right? Mm. Otherwise, we will use the original value of the, the output from multiply. Yeah, then now we get this effect oh. of it flying towards the guy. Yeah. So we only need to go faster. Yeah, then, then you just need to. Change the multiply. Yeah, correct. Just inc oh, increase the. Yeah, increase the multiply. Yeah, you get the idea, right? It's just like. Yeah, it's it. just basically like circuits, lah. It's just. Oh, actually, you know, you made it this far. I'm quite impressed. No, it took quite a while to calibrate the thing to. Oh. Yeah, it's All right. Off, yeah. Sweet. Oh. Yeah. Oh shit. <coughs> what? What is it? How do you calibrate the range of the cap? Like now, it shoots all the way over here. Like oh, okay. Um. Range right is the max you can go right. Yeah. So you get the values from the extreme end. Yeah. Then you input them. Then the multiplier yes. determined by. Uh. Oh, multiply is determined by how far your cube needs to move. So let's say your your, your so you put a cube. Can you make the cube not move? <laughs> Maybe you can break the loop animation. Break the loop animation part. Yeah. So what's your cube? Is your cube moving? Yeah, so if you physically move a cube yourself, right? I think you need to delete your, your cube's patch. Your cube's rotation, uh, your cube's position patch. Yeah. Let's just delete this, then you can move it around. Yeah. So you try to move it onto your screen, then you see what values you need. So you move, you move it in the x-axis. Oh, so now, yeah, so because your cube is not in the viewport in the first place, right? So it's a bit difficult. So you want to Set it to be like zero 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 something. Set its position to be zero zero zero. Oh, where is it now? Where is it? Oh, where is it? Where's the cube? Yeah, but the idea is that you bring the cube in that position, then you move it to the left, then you measure the distance. It's still you measure the distance, how much do you need to move the cube? So measure Yeah, correct. Like, so you see on your inspector, right? Like what is the x value? Uh -huh. What's the x value? Yeah, mm. so currently it's like, so previously it was, like maybe, what's the value? 0.1 is it? Uh, minus 0 0.28. So minus 0 0.28 to 1, to 0 0.1, something like that. Correct, so that's a difference of like 0 0.38. Correct. So then, you, then that will go into your multiply. Because okay. <laughs> now you map the value of 0 to 1 to Wait, 0. Point. This is the value, right? Yeah, this is the value. So you multiply it by. This is the value. Correct. It outputs, it outputs 0 to 1. Then you want to scale that 0 to 1 to 0 0.38. 0 to yeah, maybe I can draw, draw like a nice. Maybe I'll explain it again. Uh. Just like a quick, quick one. Okay, before we move on to the next part, right? I wanted to like talk about what we were trying to do just now. Cause maybe I probably I wasn't very clear. <laughs> Cause I just did a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so um we've got a screen, right? Then we had the cube. Then we wanted to measure what is the x value of the cube at this position and what is the x value of the cube at this position. Okay, then we want to move it in between these two. So in my the previous example, the values were zero point zero eight, negative zero point one six. Okay. Uh, then 
when I click on the, on the screen, right, the values when I click on the left side, like at this part, was uh, 80, if I remember correctly. Then I think it's six, 680 on the other side. So this one is the cube value, and this is the touch value. Okay? Got it? So we want to map the touch value to the cube's value. So the cube ranges from 0 0.08 to negative 0 0.16. We want to map it from 80 to 680. Correct? So we did the from range operator, which maps this 680 to 680 to 0 and 1. Okay? Okay? Then now we want to scale this 0 to 1 to be the same width as the as this part. Oh, my arrow's ugly. My goodness. Okay, so the difference here is 0 0.24. Correct? So if you multiply this thing by 0 to by 0 0.24, then we get 0 to 0 0.24. Then we scale it. We minus 0 0.08. So it becomes negative 0 0.08 to 0 0.16. Then we multiply. Uh, by, we, we multiply by negative 1, then we get 0 0.08 to negative 0 0.16. Yeah, that was the quick math that I was doing in the patch editor. Yeah, sorry, it was a bit difficult. Yeah, not important, not important. <laughs> you want this? You want this? I don't. <laughs> not sure if it's important to you. Okay. Okay, let's do more useful things, okay? Because we are here to learn useful things. Okay, so uh, back to my slides. Back to my slides. Yeah, so I wanted to show you this. So you all you might have seen Harry Potter, right? Then there's this like uh, Sirius Black and the animated newspaper, right? And then if you see this video, So this is by Harvard Business Review. So what they did was that they created this augmented reality magazine. So with the magazine's content, right, you can use that as a marker and you can overlay some digital imagery. So you can see here, uh, oh my goodness, my computer is really like exploding. Okay, yeah. Whoa, look at that. Some cool stuff happening on the magazine. Yeah. We're not gonna be doing something, we're not gonna be doing so advanced things, like, okay? But the underlying concepts are the same. We're going to be overlaying a digital object onto a image that we can track. All right, let's, let's do that. Okay, let me get out. Oh man, okay, let's get out. So uh, create a new project. So scrap, scrap that, scrap that, scrap that confusion stuff. Very confusing things. Okay. Then um, one thing that you might need to do is to edit properties. Go to edit properties under project. Then where it says select platform, right? Uncheck Instagram. The reason being is because the, um, the different platforms will allow and disallow different functionality. So for this example, we're going to be using the image tracking ability, right? So we want to disable Instagram because Instagram doesn't have that feature yet. Okay. So just for Facebook, huh? So we go to device, we right click, we can add this thing called fixed target tracker. Okay? Okay, then you'll get this static target tracker here. Okay? Next, we'll. Sorry, oh. Right oh, you can go to a project, yeah. then you go to edit properties, uh, then platforms, dis disable Instagram. Right. Yeah. And next, we want to add our image. So we can go to, oh, I clicked wrong button. Okay, uh, can go to static target tracker, selected here. Then we go to choose file, uh, next to texture. Choose file. Then we're going to select the whole F3, Feb 119 JPEG. This one, uh, this one. <laughs> this, this image. Uh. <laughs> sorry, I didn't rename it, uh, sorry. I was, I was feeling lazy. Yeah, okay, so let's <laughs> import that, that thing here. Okay. Oops. 
Uh, okay. So you all would have seen that your uh, uh, image would have been automatically imported into the assets at your bottom left. Okay. Yeah, then you can see here how the image looks like. So this image is actually taken during our hack and roll. Yeah, uh, one of our events, short plug, sorry. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna be overlaying some objects onto this, this scene, okay? Um, let's create another cube. Let's create another cube, okay? Okay, create another cube, primitive cube. So now we've got a primitive cube, we just drag it back into our scene. But now we drag it as a child of the static target tracker. Alright? We can add it as a child of the static target tracker. Then again, we want to like scale it because, I mean, it's so big, oh my goodness. Who will even make this cube? Okay, so now we make it look like this. Okay, now we can see in our Simulator, our cube appears to be floating over the image, right? Wow. Okay, let's, let's um, test this on our device. Okay. Very simple, huh? We just have the, the target tracker, and then we're just placing the cube as a child of the target tracker. So now the cube will follow the behavior of the target tracker. So we send to app, send to camera, send to Facebook camera. Okay. So once you all have, have, have done that, right, like exported the, your, your project, you can go to, you can either open your image on your computer and then use it as the tracking marker, or you can go to hackandroll.nushackers.org. Why this website? I don't know. I just felt like it. <laughs> yeah, then the image is actually at the bottom. Yeah. So we are using this image as the tracking marker. So if you open up the application that you have exported and point it at the screen, you should be able to see the cube hovering over the screen. You should be, yeah. You should. Let, me, let me try to, I'll, I'll see if I can sh show it, demonstrate it here. I'm not sure if it works on my com computer. Maybe it's <laughs> Did I manage to, to do it? No? What, which step are you stuck at, sir? Exporting, oh, okay, then you just wait. I, I guess it's, oh, it's because the, the first time you import the image, right, it's, it will compress the image. Yeah, so it's only the first time, it'll take it quite long to, to, to export. Yeah, then subsequently it'll be, be fine. Yeah. Let me know when um, you all have, I, when you are able to see the cube on the screen. Yeah. I'll, I'll just come around to see.
Are you are you okay? Huh? Whoa. Are you okay? Are you are you okay? Are you okay? Hmm? Uh yeah, it looks looks fine. As in uh you can move the cube potentially nearer to the, the panel. Okay. Yeah. Um but you can you open the website. Oh what's that that's a uh, not very oh. clear. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, you can just open up the image. So you got the, the image saved somewhere, right? The oh image. Yeah. Here, right? You can just open up the image. And then you just scan the image. Oh, okay. Using, using that yeah. image, is it? Yeah. So, so I just opened the image here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What so you, you export the... So you put the cube over it. Where's where the cube? Um, I don't know. Just wait after I... Huh? So you put the cube in the... Yeah, put the cube as a child of the target tracker. And now you, you see it there. Yeah. Okay, let me name a mouse. Wait, let me a mouse. Okay. Oh. Okay. Is, that, is it this one? This cube? Ah? Okay, let's put it here in front of the cube, uh, in front of the plane. Then you just view this project. Ten here, yeah. Yeah, then you just open the image on your computer. Open the image. Uh, where's the Im what is going on here? <laughs> oh. oh, here, here, this image. Yeah. So just point your camera at this image. Oh. Can? Yeah. So you put it under the target tracker. Yeah. The cube. Yeah. Yeah, just put it. Yep. Yeah, just place it like near the image, like in front, so you can see it. Yeah, so if you scan this image, you should be able to see. Hello, mm. are you are you alright? Like, I can't export oh. the thing. Oh, yeah, just just wait lah. It takes quite long. I guess because the image I use is quite high resolution. Sorry, just 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 wait for it. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, so you have you placed the cube in front? Where's the cube? Okay, it's there, right? Yeah. Okay, so you go to the um your folder where you save the image. Uh, is it yeah, here? yeah. So you right click, right click this, then you open review it. Yeah, review and finder. Then you open the image. Yeah, open it. Yeah, open it. Like open it bigger, I guess. Like just ex expand like the green green menu. Yeah, then you try to scan it. I just look at it. Yeah, so you can see the cube. So when you move the camera, yeah, the the cube will stay on the image. Oh, okay. So can? it must be the same image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Are you able to to do it? Yeah. You can track the track the image. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll take care. Oh, okay. Oh, just right click on the device. Then you should see the. Right click on device, then you should see a uh, fixed target tracker. If it's disabled, then you, you need to go to project, edit properties. Yeah, so what you should see, right, is that your screen that has image, right, will have a cube appearing in front of the image. You, you get it? You get it? Oh, still exporting, okay. okay then, then, how about, I mean, maybe I, I tell you all the reason why we're using such a big image. <laughs> I'm very tempted to say no particular reason. Oh. Yeah, so precisely it's very complex. So the way it, it works is that we want to find um, an image that has enough features, unique points that we can use to track they use it as a marker. So um, good images would be images that have a lot of corners, have a lot of like, sharp, sharp edges, sharp corners. So like your QR code yeah, QR code is, very, is a very good example because you have like, a lot of um, information and a lot of points that you can track. Yeah, so I use image in particular it was because there's a lot of information inside. Uh. Yeah. And also because it's hack and roll.
I mean, you don't have to go to the hack and roll website, okay? You can just go to the your folder and open it. <laughs> yeah. A anyone? Everyone's okay? Everyone okay? Yeah, I hope that you have exported it eventually. Because it, it takes quite long, I think, the first time you export. Yeah, I charge any way you want. And I still have you plug it. Okay, I guess I, I guess I'm. I guess this is a not subtle hint. Is it on? Do you manage to get to get it? Do you manage to get it? Mm -hmm. That's so strange. Maybe you can try to re refresh this. Refresh this. It shouldn't be the case. Maybe it should be fine. What is a mask? A mask is um basically um a, w a way to segment portions of the image, okay. like height, like mask to cover. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not sure why they want to. I'm not sure why they say it's shielding. Oh, it's still that error. Okay, yeah, it's still that error. You got the different error now. Oh, different error. Yeah, same. Uh, same. Failed. Oh, failed. Hmm. Okay. Maybe you can try another device. Okay. Or oh, if you want, you can try it on my device. You can try it on my phone. Try your phone. Yeah, I think it's yeah, I can just send a link. So <laughs> why do we have to project it over this image itself? Because we have used the same image. Yes, there. yes, yes. Yeah. So we you can, you can use any image. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can change it to your maybe image of your family. Uh -huh. Then you can project like um maybe a, a video over it. Uh -huh. Currently we're we're just projecting a a three D cube. Uh -huh. So you can pretty much project anything you want really. Uh -huh. Yeah. Are you, are you okay or not? Did you manage to, to see thing? Yeah. Did, okay. did it show up? Did it appear? That's a cube, right? That's a cube, yeah. That's a cube. <laughs> okay. While well, y'all are still struggling, or while well, some of you are still struggling, uh, I would like cover some of the more chill stuff. So like, you might be wondering like, oh, how do I get like more 3D models, right? So you can go to websites like poly.google.com where like a bunch of create creators have uploaded their, their wonderful creations for people to use. La. But I mean, I think you're supposed to like cite them. Like say, oh, I took this model from somewhere. Yeah. So in particular, for this, for this uh, demonstration, I took some of the Pokemon from this guy called Tipatat. I can't pronounce his, his last name. Yeah. But I took some Pokemon from him. Yeah, so you can download them and then import them into your, into your scene as opposed to just a boring cube. Because the cube is kind of lame, right? Or if you are more creative, you can use your own 3D modeling software. Like um, if you're familiar with what, Autodesk, uh, Rhino. Um, sketch, sketch, sketch lab, sketch, I don't know, sketch something, sketch up, sketch up, yeah. Or you can use my favorite, um, paint 3D. <laughs> oh, I love my favorite paint 3D. Oh, no. paint 3D. Oh my goodness. Sorry, sorry guys, my computer is a little um, slow today. Working very hard.
Yeah, so I, I hope that you all have um, successfully visualized the cube on the, the image. I'm going to like very briefly show you how to make your own 3D stuff. So if you're very like artistically inclined, right, this will be your time to shine. Okay. So you can actually like make 3D doodles in print 3D. Yeah, this is like super rudimentary um, 3D modeling software, okay. So you can make like a line. Oh, I guess my computer is hanging. Not too good, huh? I guess this 3D modeling is too intense. Not too intense. What? Okay. Oh no. Oh yeah, but I get the idea. You get to like draw 3D models. I I made an F because it's the start of my name. Yeah. Can? Simple stuff, right? You can also insert cubes, spheres, uh cones, whatever. Yeah. So actually if you look into the models uh folder, right? I actually uh spent one afternoon to make some <laughs> useless tree models. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see the one that's like named zero dash as zero underscore F underscore H. You can look at it. Is it I can I open it up? I, my computer is a little slow. I, I have no idea why. Sorry, technical difficulties. 3D modeling is not easy. Yeah, and also running Spark AR is quite computationally intensive, I think, because you need to do the visualization of the 3D objects and stuff. And also we are, we have the very big image. Yeah, so I made this very nice, um, very nice 3D object here. There is like a, <laughs> hey, why, why laugh? Yeah, I made it in paint 3D, okay. Yeah, so, so it's like a F from one direction, then it's like a H in another direction. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, F and then a H. Yeah. So I did this with every letter of my name <laughs> and the word hackers. So it's like F-R-A-N-C-I-S and hackers, hackers. Yeah, I did it for every <laughs> one. So if you open it up, you can see, <laughs> you can see it here, yeah. So, um, if I close this, close this. <laughs> Sorry for my um, computer's slowness. Hello. <laughs> Very slow. Uh. Yeah, so the idea is that I, I did the same thing. I put my the, the 3D models on top of the image. So this plane represents the image. Uh. So if I take my phone and I export the I export the file and I scan the image, I will see these seven alphabets in front of me. Then if I look at it from one perspective, I will see <laughs> I will see Francis. And from the other perspective, I will see hackers. <laughs> yeah, so this is something I did like in one afternoon. Yeah, using like pain 3D. So don't let yourself be limited by your by your skill sets or software. Okay? <laughs> yeah. If you want this file, you, you, I can send it to you also. Then you can try it for yourself. And <laughs> I'm not sure why you would do it, but sure. Yeah, so I've got all of the files here. I can go through with you all. So same, same thing, I've got the target tracker here on the top left. Then I've got the same image, hall F3 Fab 119. And then I put all the alphabets there. Yeah, so it's 
just basically rearranging and spending time perfecting it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, so this is just one example of how y'all can use this kind of image tracking. Yeah. I, I, I would really love to show y'all this in real life because it's really quite cool. I can look at it. Maybe later. Yeah. So this is just one example. Okay. Then we're going to go through the final demo. Okay. <laughs> final demo. Okay. Bear with me, guys. Bear with me. I know y'all might think like, wow, this guy is talking so much nonsense. Partially true. Yeah. The last demo. We're going to make use of the Pokemons that we have. Okay. Oh my goodness, my computer is really very slow. I think I should close my tabs. Okay. Okay. Let's start again, okay? So we're going to add our Pokemon into our scene. Okay, let's just add uh, Pikachu and Pikachu and uh, Charmander. Okay. We'll just use these two. Okay. Then, now instead of using the fixed target tracker, right, we're going to be using the plane tracker. Okay. So the difference is that the fixed target tracker, it targets the image. Now we want to target any arbitrary plane. So like I mentioned earlier, this is, this is termed markers, markerless tracking. So it just tracks an arbitrary plane. Okay? It can be your table, it can be your floor, it can be anything really. Okay? So what we want to do now is that we want to um, move the Pikachu as a child of the plane tracker. Wow, look at that, Pikachu. Oh, look at that. Okay. And if you can see in the viewport, it's not very clear on the screen, but there is this, um, there's this cr a square with a cross. Can you see? Uh, can, can you see this one? A square with a cross. So this square with a cross, right, it represents the, the center of the plane tracker. So everything that... Um, is displayed is with respect to this plane tracker, represented by this, this square. La. So what we're going to do now is that we want to place our Pikachu nicely on top of this square so that when we detect a plane, the Pikachu appears. Okay? Can, can we do that? Okay, let's try that. Okay, so um, it's going to be a lot of eyeballing. Uh. So, so you can see here. So you can change the view, viewpoint top left here, view, can change it to different views. Yeah, so you might need to play around with it. So one thing to note right, is that when we select the Pikachu, right, please do not click the Pikachu from the viewport. Because you will probably select only a portion of the Pikachu. And then when you move it, the eyes or the tail will fly around. I can show it to you. Like it will fly, like, you see now the eyes are, yeah, please do not dismember Pikachu, okay? So <laughs> we, want to, we want to select Pikachu as a whole, okay? As a whole. So, like I said earlier, we're going to move Pikachu to the, the square, okay? Let's move him to the square. Is Pikachu a, a guy or a girl? Uh? I, I don't know. And so, I, I'm shifting the viewport so I can precisely position Pikachu over. Because it might look like he's over it, right? But then, nope, he's like slightly below, you know? That kind of thing. So you might want to like change the, the viewpoint a little. Okay. Oh, and uh, we will need to wrap it around another object as we did previously. And we'll name it, we'll name it um, Pokemon Parent. Okay. Then we'll move our Pikachu underneath our Pokemon Parent. All right. So the order of the, um, the hierarchy is plane tracker, Pokemon parent, Pokemon Pikachu. Okay? Pokemon parent is just a null object with its um, properties, transformation, all set to the default. So our Pokemon Pikachu seems to be sitting happily on our plane tracker, right? Have you all gotten here? I hope. Yeah, so... 
you will see in our simulator, right, our Pikachu is facing the wrong way. Yeah, so we want to rotate the Pikachu. Oh, I should have rotated first. Uh. Ah, okay, my mistake. Yeah, so we want to rotate the Pikachu by 180 degrees. Oh, it's, so it's jumping around. And we want to scale it down. So let's scale it down by half. Oh, and, and it seems like it's, it's moved again from its position. So I want to move it back to the plane. It's troublesome. Yeah, so make sure that you're selecting the Pokemon Pikachu when you're doing this. Uh. Then move it on top of the plane, marker, target, plane tracker. Can? Do you all see this now? Yeah, maybe i give you a moment. So, um, to reiterate, right, the Pokemon parent, its transformation values are all the default. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay? Then I just moved the Pokemon Pikachu child object onto the square with the plus, which represents the plane tracker. Okay? And then mine, for mine, it's a bit off center, but I think, I think it's still forgivable. Still forgivable, right? Yeah. Okay? Okay, so once we reach this stage, right, we can build our project. Okay, we can just test on our device. Send it to our Facebook camera. Or your Spark AR player. And then you should see it appear on your keyboard or, or something. Yeah. Let me explain to myself. Okay, I will go around and convince you all that it works. Are you able to do it? Are you able to do it? What? Am I supposed to do after I close the now object? Oh, object. So you, s you set all the values to be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. Yeah, just put all zeros uh, at the position. Where's my Pikachu? <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, then you position the Pikachu to be on top of the square. So yeah, so you want to rotate it first. Let's rotate it like the y axis. Y put hundred eighty. Then the scale put two point five, two point five, two point five. Zero point five, like in all three axes. Yeah. Let you squish now. Okay. Yeah. Then just need to then just need to drag it onto above the the square. Yeah. You might want to change your viewpoint because you. you might have some parallax error. Okay. Have you have you got it? It's, it's somewhere, right? It's some does it exist? Okay, mine's mine's on his shoulder. He directed. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's there. Yeah. So the reason why it's there is because you didn't place your Pikachu over the the marker properly. So it's still hovering, right? So you kind of want to position it nicely. So. Um, we want to create this uh, a parent to wrap around the uh, Pikachu. So for late, for later lah. Mm. So we want to create a null object. Null object. Mm. Then we want to name it the parent. Okay. Can we can we name it later? But basically, this one should go underneath. Mm. But it's for later lah. Okay. So now we want to reposition it to oh be God. on top. Oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> oh, can can connect. Get a charger. Yeah, but yeah, you can just try to follow along. Do you need an extension cord? Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah. Alright. Are we doing okay, guys? Are we doing okay? Anyone need more extension cords? Thank you. Anyone need more extension cords? 
Has, has uh, everyone seen Pikachu? Does it look all right? <laughs> oh, coding. Yo, yo, managed to get it up. Can, can? How do we assign the plane? Plane marker? Yeah. Uh, like sometimes it's sensitive, sometimes it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like the limitation of the yeah, software. It's like that. Yeah, but that's the general idea. La. I guess you got it, like roughly the correct position. Should be fine, lah. Okay, yeah, can ah. It's fine. Cause it, it depends on where it depends on whether or not it tracks the, it as a plane. Yeah, but try on the floor, lor. The floor should be fine, lah. Yeah. Oh, then you try to restart the application and point it at the floor. Yeah. Then, but at least you got something on the screen, right? So it's okay, right? Okay, that's that's good. You all managed to get it to work. Yeah, we got it. Okay. Oh yeah, just need to ro rotate it around. Yeah. Okay, so you, you don't want to modify the the, the parent, so um, I want I want y'all to yeah, so one, yeah one. set it to one then change this all to zero. Zero. Yeah, change all to zero. And similarly, change the rotation to be zero because we will need this for later. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Okay, so for the picture itself, we will we will change. Uh, scale, uh -huh. make it smaller, 2.5, oh, oops, 0 0.5, then we'll rotate it by 180 degrees, oh. yeah, now, so now it's facing the correct way, but it's still positioned wrongly, uh -huh. so we will just move it to top, like this, okay. yeah, so it's a bit, still a bit wrong, but we just nicely, okay. yeah, so now it's on top of the marker, okay. yeah, okay? Uh, so that's, that's how it is. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Looks can right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. I hope that we are all okay. We are all okay. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Where does it go? Oh no, uh, just, just right click the plane tracker. <laughs> now object. Yeah, then just make the Pokemon Pikachu uh, a child of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. I'm going to like move a bit faster, okay? Cause running out of time, and we want to make our Pikachu look good. Not look good. I mean, it looks good already. I mean, move. Okay. So, what we're going to do now, right, is that we are going to. Um, Oh, you might have found that sometimes your, po your Pokemon or your Pikachu is like um, off the screen, right? It detects a plane, but then it's like flying off somewhere. So we want to be able to move it around in our, on our plane. So what we're going to do is that we're going to map the X and Y value of the finger, finger press, finger position, right? Uh, onto the X and Z value of the Pikachu's location on the plane. Okay? So you can imagine like, can imagine that this is a plane. Pikachu is like, like this, right? So we want to map the value of, of x and y on our finger swipe to the position on the plane. So this is like the x axis, this is the z axis, and this is the y axis. Okay? So we want to make the Pikachu move around on the plane. Okay? okay, so how do we do that? So first step is to get our favorite patch editor out. Control alternate P if you're using Windows. If you're using Mac, okay. So we're going to create. You use the screen pen object, pen, screen pen patch, screen pen, okay. Screen pen, screen pen, okay. Screen pen patch has like a uh, three outputs: state, two D offset, three D position. Uh, we're not too interested in the two D position, but more so of the two D offset which refers to how much we have swiped. <coughs> how much we have swiped, okay? Moved, the, moved around, okay? So, uh, we want to create more patches, okay? Let's, let's, let's do this fast game. Okay, we're going to create the, the divide patch. Divide, okay? Put it here. Okay, I might want to zoom. Oh. 
zoom in here. Okay. Divide patch. Then next we're going to have the unpack patch. Then we're going to have the pack patch. And last but not least, we want to have the position patch of the Pokemon parent. Okay, um, very important. Uh, um, your Pokemon parent needs to be 0, 0, 0 in position, 1, 1, 1 in scale, and 0, 0, 0 in, ro in rotation. So all of the modifications of your Pokemon right, should be done as uh, it should be done on the chow of the Pokemon parent, on the actual Pikachu itself. Okay? Because what we're going to do is that we're going to be manipulating this Pokemon parent and moving it around, which, we, which houses the Pikachu inside that will follow along. Okay? okay? We don't want to modify the actual values of Pikachu because we have, we have um, taken a lot of time to position it in the correct place. Right? So we don't want to ruin that. Okay? So, like I mentioned earlier, we select Pokemon parent and we create a position patch. And you put it here. So let's see what do we get out of the screen pan. Okay, like I said earlier, we're going to be using the two D offset. So we want to change our our what do you call it? The type of the divide patch to be vector two, because we'll be taking in two vectors, uh, two two values. Okay. Let me try try to position this nicely. Then we connect the two D offset. The second, the second output into divide, okay, and we will divide it by one thousand. Why? No particular reason. Uh, actually, the reason is because, um, from my experiments, the screen pan when you move around, right, it moves the Pikachu too 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 fast. Yeah, so we want to slow it down by dividing it by one thousand, okay. So similarly, we change the unpack type to be vector two because we only have two values that are coming in. Then now we've got the x and y values, right? You can see here. So we want to map the x and y values to the x and z value of the position of the Pokemon parent. Okay? So we map the x to x and y to z. Okay? So uh, first, the first output to the first input of pack. Second output of unpack to the third input of pack. Okay? Then we connect it to the Pokemon parent's position. Okay, we should have made it this far. Okay, so uh, next we will want to try out this thing, right? So let's simulate touch. Okay, you go onto the simulator, press the hamburger menu on the top right hand corner and press simulate touch. Okay, now that we simulate touch, right, we try to drag the Pikachu around. So if you drag upwards, you'll move forward into the plane. So if I'm dragged downwards, then you'll move closer to me. So you can see that our Pikachu moves Wow, wow, crazy stuff, right? Yeah, <laughs> crazy stuff. Okay, and if you export this um, application, right, to your phone, you should also see similar functionality. Okay. Are you able to move the Pikachu now? Look at how much control you have over the Pikachu now. Isn't it great? <laughs> huh? No. Okay. So, help. <laughs> hmm? Oh, you press. Are you, are you in the correct mode? Simulate touch. Eh? Drag it. I think it's your, just your touchpad. Uh. Really? Can't drag. No, can drag. Can drag. Because if I do orbit, I can drag. Oh. I don't know why. There's probably something wrong here. Unpack screen pen. Is this correct? Uh? Is it, is it 1000? Yeah. Is it correct? Yes, both are 1000. Okay. Why doesn't it work? Oh, does it need to be plugged into this? No, no, no. Unpack. I think he's correct. Uh. You try to, try to move again. I oh, can try to export it onto your phone. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I can try that. What is that, the last patch? <laughs> last patch. You press the Pokemon parent. Okay, mm. then you press the position arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, but your, your Pikachu is facing the wrong way. <laughs> but it's okay, it's okay, it's fine. Okay, so let me um, reiterate like how this patch circuit reads, okay? It reads from left to right. Screen pan, I'm taking the 2D offset and I'm dividing the values by 1000 on both the X and Y values, okay? Then I'm unpacking the values so that I can take these two individual signals and rearranging and re rearrange them to however I want. So I rearrange them by passing it into the pack patch in the X and Z axis, and then finally into the Pokemon parent. Okay, then you can get this kind of behavior. Yeah, if you're using a Mac, it might be difficult to drag. Uh. Cannot. Thumbs down to you. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? What's wrong with people? Maybe, maybe you can cross and start again. <coughs> Where is it? Why, why is yours not working? Is, uh, did I do something wrong? Uh, it's uh, under the plane tracker. Yeah. Right? Pokemon parent. Yeah. It should be correct. Wait, can, can you see? Yeah, it should be alright. Can you drag it further away? Yeah, it's quite connected, right? Why? Maybe you can just save and open again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you able to move the... <coughs> move it around? <coughs> can? Can? Oh, cannot. Oh, where did... Oh, so it's out of the viewport, right? So you might want to um, reset your camera. Reset camera. Then... Uh, oh, it's there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's fine, right? Mm. Okay. <laughs> then can you move it? Drag. Yeah. Yeah, we move upwards. Yeah, look, looks about right. A bit small, ah. Uh, but never mind, lah. Uh, we'll fix it later. <laughs> okay, I, I need to continue, okay? Okay, so... so uh, I hope that you all have um, managed to move the Pikachu a bit. Okay, we'll next add more functionali functionality, okay? So, some of you all have might notice, right, that your Pikachu is too small or too big. So, we want to be able to resize it. So, now we're going to add this screen pen, the screen pinch patch. Okay? Screen pinch. Again, it has this scale as output, and then we want to map this scale to the scale of our Pokemon parent. Okay? So, we create a pack patch again. And we create the scale patch from the Pokemon parent. Can? Can? So now we take the values from the scale and we put it into all three values on the pack patch. And we output this value onto the Pokemon parent's 3D scale. Okay? So um, if I could pinch on my computer, it would work, but I can't. <laughs> yeah, it still translates. Yeah, so um, if you export this onto your phone, you should be able to resize the, your Pokemon, okay? Sorry that I cannot show you that it works. Just take my word on it, okay? Okay, then lastly, right, we want to add, um, some functionality to rotate the Pikachu. So next we're going to, yeah, cause some of your Pikachu's are facing the wrong way, right? Cause y'all didn't rotate it at the start. So now we will add a screen rotate patch. And we will um, create a pack patch again. Pack patch. And then we will create the rotation patch. Okay. Oh, a lot of patches, huh? Okay. And because the y axis faces up, right? So we want to rotate about this axis. Okay? Rotate about this axis. So we will map the rotation value to the y axis of the pack patch. And then output it to the Pokemon parent's 3D rotation. Okay? No? <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you build this project right now, right, you'll find that you're un unable to rotate it properly because 
it rotates in the opposite direction. If you make it, if you rotate it clockwise, cl clockwise, the Pokemon seems to rotate anti-clockwise. So we want to inverse this effect. So we want to use multiply, the multiply patch, and we want to multiply this value by one, uh, by negative one, sorry. By negative one. Okay, so now it will be in the correct direction. Okay? Yeah, so, okay, let's just take a breather here, okay? You can export this project and then try to see on the phone. So now we should have complete control over Pokemon Pikachu. Ideally. Yeah, if all, all goes right. Yeah, so to reiterate what, what we have just done, we created basically three sub circuits, three, three circuits of um, pa uh, patch circuit to add three different functionality to our project. Okay, the first one is to map the, pan, the, the screen pan information into the 3D position of the Pokemon, the screen pinch information into the size of the Pokemon, and the screen rotate functionality to the rotation of the Pokemon. Ken? Are you able to manipulate your Pikachus or Pokemon? Are, are you okay? Okay, okay. I think I'll come by. I, I think I can show you all how it's supposed to look like. Uh. So you all can take some reference. But AR player. Are you are you okay? Is it is it is it moving? Oh shit. Yeah, mine mine is like this. Yours yours working? Yeah, same ma, same ma. It's just same ma. <laughs> okay, figure out. Oh. Um, yeah, so, yeah, correct, we divide it by, divide it by, oh, no, you don't need to connect this. So, we want to break this connection. How to break it? Break it? No, 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 you just need to break it. Break this connection. Okay, break it, right? Then we change it to 1,000. Yeah, yeah, 1,000? Yeah, okay, yeah, then, it's, then it should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Then. Yeah, yeah, correct. Gone. So now it just exists somewhere. Because oh. previously you might have. Um, oh, you, you add this one. Yeah, added now object, right? Oh, so this, this one should be the position of. The now object. The now object, yeah. Oh, so the position. Okay. Yeah, now object. So I, I named this as the Pokemon parent. Oh. Yeah, so the Pikachu exists as a sub, sub object. Uh, I think it's okay. La. Reset. Fine. That's fine. I just reset it. I just now we moved a lot. Oh, you yeah. reset it. Yeah. So, um, you might want to move your Pikachu a bit lower to the plane. Now it looks like it's on the ground. Mm. Yeah. Then now you can move it around left, right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So what I did was that I continue making more patches and add the functionality. Yeah. So maybe I, I will just repeat later. Okay. Um, yes. You can do. Would you, which framework do you use? Um, um, I'll, I'll go into that later at, at, at the end. Yeah, what I can do. Yeah. So, are, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Now, when we pack it, right? Uh -huh. Everything will follow a particular value. Mm -hmm. So, when it starts out, right? Mm. It will just be <coughs> taking out the entire screen. Is there a way to actually. Yeah, so you can scale it down at the start. Like, like you can scale the sub sub object, whatever it is. Actually, okay. So, so for what I did, I scaled my Pokemon down by half. So you scale. So because you're right to say that like all these values will control the Pokemon parent, yeah. right? Correct. So you want to change the sub values. So I, I mean you. So all the sub values. No. So I, so I, I, I see that you didn't add the uh, Pokemon parent. So for what I, I did, the demonstration is that I wrapped this thing as a Pokemon parent. So oh, I wrap another correct, correct. I create like a now object. Now object. Then I name this as Pokemon parent. Then I put this as a sub object. Then now all of this is my now object. Can? Can? Yeah. You all managed to get it to work? Yeah. Can move the thing around? Okay, cool, cool.
Okay, I, I, I hope that you all managed to um, get it working. Get it working. So the last functionality that we're going to add, right, is the ability to switch between different Pokemons. Yeah, of course, I mean, Pikachu is like cute, right, but then it's like you get bored of it after a while. So how do we do that? Okay, so currently we got two Pokemons, right, so we want to switch between the two. So uh, we want to maintain the functionality as per what we did previously. But now we want to add in the Pokemon Charmander as a sub, as a, as a child of the Pokemon parent. So it exists as the as a same tier as the Pokemon Pikachu. Can? So um, this Charmander is a bit uh, not in the right position. So we need to reposition the Charmander just like how we position it, we position the Pikachu just now. Okay. So we rotate it, maybe we can scale it by half so that it looks similar in size to the Pikachu. Then we can try to position it correctly. I mean, yeah, position it correctly. Okay. So it's roughly in the same position, okay? That's, that's fine, right? So what we're going to do to switch between the two, right, is that both of the Pokemon are going to coexist together under Pokemon Parent, but we're just going to make them visible one at a time. Okay? So let's make the Charmander invisible by selecting Pokemon Charmander, and then we select visible, and then we now, now it's gone. Okay? okay? So we make the Pokemon Charmander invisible. Alright? So the next step we need to do is that we want to add the sc screen tap patch once again. So now we're going to use the screen tap to, to um, change the Pokemon. Okay. I think I tried to zoom out a bit uh, so y'all can refer to the upper parts. <laughs> are are y'all okay? C can see right? Can see the upper parts? If you all refer to it, okay. So uh, we will map the screen tab to a counter. So this counter will store which Pokemon we are currently looking at, okay. So we change the maximum count to be two because we have only two Pokemon, but this number would be however number of Pokemon that we have. Then next we want to um, map the tap output from screen tab into increase, okay? Yeah, I want to see that it increases. Does it increase? Okay. So let's uh, create a value, a value patch to be able to see what's the output. Okay. So currently the value is one. If I tap the screen, now it's zero. Now it's one. I'm not sure you can see. Very, very, very faint here. Very faint. But, but take my word for it. It's zero, one, zero, one. All right. So what's, what's happening now is that the screen tap is, is basically creating a pulse whenever we touch the screen. Okay. Then we map that pulse to the increase input on counter. So the counter patch will increment the counter whenever there's a pulse input, okay? And because our maximum count is two, whenever it increases more than one, it will loop back to zero. Because um, in computing, we always start with index zero. So when we, when we say we have two elements, we have actually element zero and element one. So once the counter hits two, then it, it goes back to element zero, okay? So, um, we're gonna do more fancy, fancy logic here. So we're gonna use the equals exactly patch. Okay. All right, right. So if the value of the counter equals exactly zero, then I will make the Pokemon Pikachu's visible, the visibility true. Can? 
So it reads from left to right. Counter will control, uh, will, will have a value that is compared against our number here, 0. And if it's equal to 0, then it will be visible. Otherwise, it won't be visible. So let's say I press the screen now, right? So now the value in the counter is 1. 1 is not equal to 0. Yes, no surprise there. And now the Pokemon is not on the screen anymore. Okay? So 0, 1, 0, 1, great. Okay, next Pokemon that we want to, to map. So we take the Pokemon Charmander and we do, the similar, do something similar. We create a visibility patch for Charmander as well. And then we will create a equals exactly patch as well. Okay? So now instead of being equals exactly to 0, we want it to be equals exactly to 1. Because our values on the counter will be from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1. Then we connect it to Pokemon Charmander, and now we can see Charmander appearing when the counter's value is 1. So this way we can switch between the Pokemons. Okay? Uh, then we can, of course, add in more Pokemons. We can add in like a. Oh, oh what did I do? We can add in Squirtle and Bubblesaur to join the gang. Yep. So just drag them in. Throw them in. Then do the repositioning step again. Where did it go? <laughs> yeah, so you need to reposition the squatter again. Okay, something like that. Uh. Don't be too picky. Uh. Okay, then we can add the squirtles. Oh, we can add the squirtles visibility as, a, as another patch. Then now we can create another patch equals exactly, you guessed it, to. Okay. Then we'll map the values as an input of equal exactly and then map the value to be here. Okay, then now we need to increase the maximum count to be 3. So now the values of the counter change from 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. So now we got 3 Pokemon. Yeah, so you can do this for like arbitrary number of Pokemons. Uh. And all of these Pokemons, because they are um, a child of the Pokemon parent, which we can manipulate using the screen, screen uh, pinches and and rotations and whatnot. So they will all have the same functionality as the Pokemon Pikachu. Can? Yeah. So that's that's actually all there is to it for the workshop. This is like the end goal. Yeah, so you can build your project and then you can play around with the Pokemon. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be Pokemon, it can be um, any of your wonderful creations that you make in 3D Paint or or whatever software you, you are using. Okay? Uh, any questions at this point? It was kind of me just rambling, actually. Yeah. Uh, I need to find my slide somewhere now. Let me find my slides. Uh. Are you able to get the Pokemon out and moving and changing? And I don't know what else you want.
back to my good old slides. You also need to refer to the, the patch circuit thingy. You also need to refer? Slower. Yeah, okay, so why did we do all of that? nonsense with the Pokemon. Um, so I wanted to show you this video. So this is um, an augmented reality application done by IKEA. So they help you to visualize how your furniture will look like in your house. So it's just similar to what we have done. Instead of putting a Pikachu, you just put a furniture. Yeah, and this one has like actual real world use, right? Yeah. Oh, buffering. Lost. Yeah, so if you if y'all have y'all saw right, like they did the rotation, scaling, all within the application itself. Yeah, so that was what I wanted to like try to have y'all build to some degree. Yeah. So of course this is a very simple application because all you have is just the Pokemon itself. But I think it um is good enough to be able to demonstrate some of the ideas in augmented reality. Like for example, tracking the plane and manipulating the objects. Can? So, coming to the end, yeah, so what's next? So actually, um, uh, much of the content was based off the documentation by uh, Spark AR. So they've got some of the tutorials online and guides online. Um, many of them include like how to make your own filters, like Instagram filters, so you can play around with those. Uh, I will send you all this slide, or a select few slides, uh, because most of the pictures I took from the internet, I don't think I can share them with you all. Cause you know, copyright and stuff. Um, what's next? Google Call, uh, Google AR Call with Unity. So AR Call is this um, developing kit that is uh, by Google. Um, so that application you can build it. You can build as in that SDK you can use with um, Unity, or you can use with just general Android programming. But that one is a lot more. Um, Challenging than than Spark AR, yeah. I think using it with Unity is fine also. Yeah, so in, in Unity itself, you also will see a lot of the similar elements that you saw earlier, um, with respect to like the inspector, the viewport, the hierarchy, and the assets. Maybe later I will show you all how it looks like in, in Unity. So Unity is what a lot of the big companies use to create augmented reality experiences or virtual reality experiences. So initially, actually for this workshop, I wanted to do everything in Unity, but it takes quite some time to set up, and also uh, Google AR Core is quite difficult to use with iOS. Yeah, and I cannot really predict what will happen in, on iOS, so I just did Spark AR instead. So I think that's uh, easier for us. Yeah, and next is um, AR Foundation, also similar to AR Core. AR Foundation is this organization trying to consolidate all of these different um, SDKs, like um, they're trying to be device agnostic. So, for example, um, Android devices, iOS devices should both be able to use AR Core at the at the higher level, uh, AR Foundation at the higher level, and then they will do all the lower level stuff like mapping uh, whatever you do in AR Foundation to AR Core and AR Kit. Okay, so it's supposed to be more universal. And of course, the next one is uh, Web VR. Basically, web ex uh, VR experiences that exist on the web, so you can. Um, run them on your handphones and then put it into like this cardboard thingy and then you can view 360 degree experiences or you can um, have controllers and then ma manipulate the you can use, use, that, use them as input in the virtual environment so all of this can be done on your mobile devices or your laptop I didn't go through any of those um, more challenging ones like interfacing with for example the HoloLens or the uh, VR headsets, like the HTC Vive, all those, because they all have their own different uh, developer kits. Yeah, so this is just more for like us, you know, our level, you know, like beginner friendly. Yeah, yeah. Can? Yeah. Any questions? I guess not. Yeah. Then that's that's about it. 
Yeah, so you can go to this link. That that link. Yeah, for some feedback. You can scan this QR code too. Sorry, I messed up here. Yeah, you can scan this QR code and give some feedback so that we can improve. Like, what do you like about this workshop? Or what do you hate about this workshop? Maybe I talk too much nonsense. Maybe I talk too little nonsense. Um, maybe you want to have uh, other demonstrations. Maybe you found it useless. Maybe you find Pokemons repulsive. Maybe you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just feedback, okay, feedback. Ken? Sorry, I talk a lot of nonsense. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. 